Hey guys, before we get this video started, I just wanted to let you know that I talked the guys over at goodoldgames.com into putting the suffering on sale, which is good for two very important reasons. Number one, the suffering is a great game and getting stuff at a lower price than usual is always good. And number two, as of right now, this is the only spot where you can actually get the suffering online. So if you're looking to get a great game at an insane price and help out the channel, check the link in the description. I've said this before, but despite my borderline unhealthy obsession with the survival horror subgenre, I'm not really all that interested in overall horror. From video games to movies, I don't really go out of my way to check out horror titles, and I'd love to tell you that's because I'm so hard nothing scares me anymore, but let's just say there's a good amount of evidence out there to disprove that little theory. I believe... Oh, fuck! God damn it! They got me with that! God, I've beaten this game like seven or eight times. <laughs> I may never really figure out why I love one sector of the genre, but mostly stay away from everything else. I can, however, tell you one thing. If I'm going to play a straight-up horror game, it's got to have something that makes it interesting. Whether it's unique gameplay, a cool story, or a main character with sick-looking mutton chops, it's got to stand out, and well, 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 what do we have here? Today we're going to be taking a look at a game that a whole lot of you have wanted me to cover for a very long time in a perfect example of better late than never. What's up guys, I'm Jared and this is Avalanche Reviews. The Suffering, like most games, started as a pitch, and that pitch described a third-person horror game with the stylus action and shooting of Devil May Cry, the setting of Resident Evil, and the immersion of Half-Life. And while those are some pretty lofty goals, I think we should probably wait till later in the video before we go over whether or not they hit that benchmark. As the game started to take shape, its designer Richard Rouse wanted to stay away from the survival horror side of things and, as he put it, focus more on combat while avoiding the long cutscenes, frail characters, clumsy controls, fixed camera angles, and sparse ammo found in those games. And yes, those words do hurt me deep down at the core of my being, but in his defense, that's exactly what he did. The Suffering is actually a very interesting story. It's one of those rare games whose concept survived the absolute insanity of development and came out the other side almost exactly how it was envisioned in the first place. From its moral decisions to the interactivity of its environments, The Suffering seems to be almost exactly what Rouse had in mind, and regardless of where the rest of this video goes, good or bad, that's something to stand in awe of. In this industry, it is not uncommon for a good idea like this one to be twisted and misshapen by executive bigwigs, technical limitations, and the worst of them all, focus testing. Sure, it'd be nice if this happened more often, but I guess if it did, that would make titles like this a little less special. Well, talk and development is all well and good, but I think it's about time we got into this game's story, and for those of you wondering, yes, I am still processing those anti-survival horror comments. Be quiet, you jerry curled fool. The suffering starts out in a manner that manages to be both interesting and, we'll say, stereotypical at the same time. You play as this pair of sideburns masquerading as a person, aka Torque, and you're not exactly stepping in on his best day. If the guards escorting him to his cell are to be believed, Torque not only beat his wife to death, but drowned one of his kids and threw the other one out of a window, making him one of the very few people in history to out Chris Benoit, Chris Benoit. The needle's too good for him. Filthy inmate, they should all die. Seems like he's been sentenced to sit on death row at Abbott Prison, one hell of a correctional facility nestled into Carnate Island, a place with a nasty history of pain, torture, and death. But in all fairness, you probably already guessed that, based solely on the name Carnate Island, Carnate just sounds evil as shit. Once he's placed in his cell, the local residents give him the kind of hearty welcome you'd expect from residents at a maximum security prison, but before anyone could get too deep in conversation, there's some kind of an earthquake. This obviously freaks out the inmates, and the situation only gets worse when the power starts going in and out. Well, some might say that the faceless abominations picking people off one by one is a little more worrying, but you know what they say about opinions. 
So something lets Torque out of his cell, and we actually get a look at what's causing all this chaos. After seeing whatever the hell this is, Torque decides this isn't going to be one of those barehanded kind of fights and gets himself a shiv. And from here, the goal becomes a pretty simple game of don't die. Not only are there dangerous inmates on the loose, but COs are capping people left and right. Oh, and the nightmare creatures roaming Abbott are also pretty high on the tier list as well. So from here on out, the word story gets a little hazy, because for the vast majority of the game, you're not really going to learn much about Torque, what he did, or who he is. Which I guess makes sense, because no one here really knows the guy past one inmate who served time with him elsewhere, and even he doesn't know much more than his name. Now call me crazy, but I'm willing to bet that's because Torque never at any point opens his mouth to say a single word throughout this entire game. That being the case, most of the narrative you experience from here on out will be made up of other people's stories and the general history of the prison or the island it's seated on. Here and there, you're going to run into fellow Abbott alumni on both sides of the bars, and sure, you're not going to get any backstory or anything, but you will get what I would call the bare minimum to characterize them. My favorite being the CO who decides he wants nothing to do with the two major options people seem to be taking, that being stand and fight or run and hide. Instead of messing with all of that, this guy just wants to sit in the attic of a mental asylum while smoking weed and listening to heavy metal, which no joke makes him one of the most endearing characters in the game. I hear the sounds. Boom, crash, ah! I've seen some things through the doorway there. Things I don't want to see again. Understand? Honestly, I think it'd be really easy to make the case that the penitentiary here is the real main character of the story, or more accurately, the island it sits on. And a majority of that story is a bunch of messed up shit. We've got the aforementioned torturous mental asylum, a history of puritanical witch burning, Nazi POWs, and this place even played at least a small role in the African slave trade. It truly is a dark setting, and as you progress through the game, you start to unlock more and more of the absolute horror that took place on this soil. As you do, you start to see the full picture. See, all the suffering and torture that took place here has sort of stained this little island, and in the same vein as a certain foggy lakeside town, the place is now giving physical form to all the acts of depravity that took place here. Which explains why there are gross little shiv monsters running around on makeshift bladed appendages. Early on in the game, you get introduced to what I can only describe as the shot callers of this place. Three individuals that, like every abomination here, represent some form of suffering and torture. There's Dr. Killjoy, a twisted psychiatrist who follows what you might call a more primitive form of mental health care, mainly the kind that has you torturing your patients and cutting out their brains. He appears through these old projectors, and I'm not really sure why, but that's really cool to me. The guy even talks in that old-timey, black-and-white movie, Transatlantic style. Killjoy sees Torque as a psychological curiosity and says he wants to cure him of his anger, which, by the way, manifests itself as a form you could only really describe as halfway between a Super Saiyan and a Cenobite. Next up in the rogues gallery is Hermes, who used to be an executioner for Abbott until he offed himself via gas chamber, and Horus, a guy who, unlike the other two, doesn't really seem to take any joy in his current predicament. This guy was apparently locked up in Abbott and killed his own wife during a conjugal visit. Horus seems to be the only one out of the three who actually regrets his actions when he was alive and said that it wasn't necessarily him that did the deed, but instead he was coerced or at least affected by the evil of this place. These three will be your constant antagonist as the game goes on and will make appearances on and off during your playthrough. Killjoy acts like a YouTube comment section by armchair psychoanalyzing Torque and really takes an interest in his ability to let his inner monster out. Hermes seems to just follow Torque around killing people and trying to convince him to do the same, and while Horus sort of does the same thing, his tortured tone of voice and obvious protests give off the feel that he's being forced into this. In fact, the entire plot seems to point towards the idea that Carnate, or at least Abbott, wants Torque to join that trio. And to make my next point, we've got to talk about the moral choice system. Now, it is important to say these things weren't non-existent in 2004, but they certainly weren't common outside of niche Western RPGs. I say that because this is not your modern gaming style of moral choice, where you pick from a list of dialogue options, each one labeled with what moral outcome it'll provoke. Instead, the game just keeps track of who you kill and who you don't. 
As you come across other surviving Carnate Island residents, you let them join your little escape attempt or put a dirty shiv through their head. Now sure, this is a pretty simple concept, even for an early 2000s release, but having those choices be made during actual gameplay sort of takes the guided, curated feeling out of it. In my head, Torque is actually a nice guy who's just got a bad temper, so when I play the game, I try keeping everyone alive, but if you start it up and think he's a brutal murderer, you can act accordingly. Well anyways, the point is, when you come across these people, you can hear voices trying to nudge you in one direction or another. Your wife tells you to let people live and be a good person, but there's another demonic sounding voice telling you to cut him into pieces. Make him bleed. He can teach you a lot. See what he has to kill, say. Kill him, kill him, kill him. So it seems to me, whatever this evil force is, it's trying to get you to follow your baser instincts. Sort of like it did to Horus. Clearly, it wants to add you to its collection of tortured souls, but it can't do that unless you make all the decisions of your own free will. And I really like that. It's a plot point you can sort of infer, but never to my knowledge gets outright confirmed in the game proper. Of course, I could be getting that wrong. Back when I first played the game when it launched, I thought the place had seen so much death and desolation that Torque showing up sort of acted like the straw that broke the camel's back. And that one's equally as cool to me. I really like the idea of Torque being that extra drop of water that caused the pot to boil over. Honestly, either way though, it's an awesome little story, but I really like that you could jump to a few different conclusions and unless I'm missing some file or journal entry, both are relatively plausible. Oh, and by the way, despite the devs being against the whole survival horror thing, The Suffering gives you a lot of extra backstory via written logs just laying around everywhere, only they're handled really poorly here. Instead of putting them somewhere that makes sense, they take up a spot in your real-time inventory, and the way you read them is the same way you cycle through guns, melee weapons, and throwables. This just does not make sense to me and kind of feels like an afterthought, which is a shame because they look so damn good. They're all different looking and visually unique, but the kicker is you have to read the file itself. It's not converted to in-game text like in a Silent Hill or Resident Evil game. So here's hoping you weren't using some terrible CRT with a composite connection, because even upscaled, this stuff had me squinting at my screen. Still though, this was an awesome little idea, I just wish it would have been executed a little better. I've heard other people covering this game say that there's not much story here. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I'm a picky bitch. I like, I like stories. I like characters. I like tension. I like getting a little spooked. Uh, none of those things seem to come together for me on this one. By the way, Grimbeard has an amazing channel. Can't recommend his content enough. But I think the disconnect is that there's barely any story concerning the actual setup. You don't learn much about Torque throughout 99% of the game. Sure, you do have these awesome little flashbacks and some brutally dark visions that seem to pop up at the most insane times, but that's just a reflection of him feeling bad. You hear from hallucinations of his wife as you encounter certain things that jog his memory, but these are all just examples of information we already had. He used to have a family, and he was accused of killing them. He can't remember doing that, and he feels horrible about it. It may sound like a bit of a narrative turnoff, but from start to finish, you don't find out much more than what I just said. So instead, the real story is about the island and the people who lived and, I guess more importantly, died here. There's tons of backstory covering stuff like what happened when it was a POW site for Nazis or when an old slave ship ran aground and instead of letting the slaves out, the assholes just left them chained up in the ship to get devoured by vermin. In reality, there's story to be found all over the game, but it's just not the and here's how it all comes together kind of story. I feel like The Suffering gives you a bunch of puzzle pieces and says, here, you put them together. There's all kinds of conclusions someone could come to, and throwing in three separate endings really helps with that. Now, someone saying that none of these pieces ever come together and form a cohesive thread would be totally correct, and I can see why that'd be a big pain in the ass, but maybe just take all the disparate artifacts this game gives you and piece them together in a way that makes sense to you. Unlike a series like Silent Hill that has created a bit of a trend of fans theorizing over elements already explained fully in-game, the suffering actually does give you room to make your own little tale. Of course, I can see how that might not be quite as fulfilling as having things explained outright. I mean, 9 times out of 10 I'd be right there with you, but I don't know, it just works here. Or at the very least, it does on me. But having said that, I do want to talk endgame stuff, which means spoilers inbound, so if this is something you want to unravel yourself, head to the timestamp on screen or use the chapters to skip past the section marked spoilers and we'll catch back up with you in a second. 
we better stay away from the fucking basement. If things are bad up here, down there, it's going to be like the mouth of hell. As you progress through the suffering, your interactions with Dr. Killjoy have him being very interested in the concept of you transforming when you get mad, and I really like this. Unlike Abbott itself, it seems like Killjoy actually wants to cure you of this problem, but you get the feeling that it's not due to a humanitarian streak in him, but instead a need to solve problems and experiment with new psychological phenomena. And speaking of that transformation, there's this sort of lingering question hovering around that. Like, is this really happening? I mean, sure, we're stuck in a prison filled with otherworldly horrors. Something like Torque turning into a turbo murderer with a demon form isn't so far-fetched, but outside of the paranormal enemies, the rest of the game is pretty grounded and straight-laced, I would say. The story doesn't have Torque made out to be some kind of half-man, half-monster. He's just a really angry guy who's had some rough run-ins with the law. Well, if you read one of Killjoy's logs, found in the asylum, I think, his estimation is that while it may appear like a transformation from Torque's perspective, in reality it's just a trick his mind plays on him so he can go to that dark place that allows him to be so violent. Almost like it's giving him a few degrees of separation from his actions when he's in that rage mode. And if I'm being honest, that's actually an interesting explanation that I thought was really cool, but throughout the game this creature shows up and has a tangible effect on the environment. If you'll remember, it was Torque's little inner demon that destroyed the bars to his cell, letting him out in the first place. I'm sure you could explain this with some sort of Silent Hill-esque deal where your inner negativity can be manifest on Carnate Island or with the more plausible scenario that would have the prison itself letting Torque out so he could be in a better position to turn into the murderer it wants him to be. But either way, it's just really cool that the dev team went out of their way to explain a gameplay mechanic. That's an awesome show of effort and, in my mind, increases immersion. Well, getting back on track with the actual story, as you know, Torque's initial prison-worthy offense was tied around his family being killed, and since he doesn't remember doing it, he spends the whole game either racked with guilt over the possibility of doing it, or if it wasn't him, letting it happen to the people he loves. I think the devs took the correct route with that cool of a setup and had your decisions through the course of the game affect the particulars of that whole scenario. For example, if you help enough people and refrain from killing anyone who isn't already trying to kill you, the game ends in a cutscene where Torque remembers more of that day. Apparently, it was a group of thugs that broke in with the goal of murdering Torque's family and leaving him alive, all of this being under the orders of someone named the Colonel. Now, I'm not sure if this means Torque had a military background or maybe the Eastern they mentioned is a prison Torque previously did time in, but I thought this was actually really cool. It answers the one question you will most definitely have throughout the game while posing an extra one, setting up the possibility for a sequel. Of course, if you go out of your way to be an evil asshole, you'll get an ending that has a slightly darker tone. After defeating the monster of his own anger, Torque's post-nut clarity has him remembering killing each member of his family, and when the rescue boat arrives, he just kills the guy and runs back into the depths of Carnate, sort of like he's exactly where he belongs, which I'd say is pretty boilerplate for a bad ending. However, it's the middle ending that is probably the most gruesome if you ask me. If you don't score enough good boy points during your stay at Abbott, but don't go too far out of your way to kill anyone, you'll be left with the reality that Torque is sort of to blame for at least one of the deaths that occurred that day. Him and his wife get into an argument, and in a fit of rage, Torque pushes her, causing her to fall over and hit her head hard enough to kill her. Torque's oldest son walks in and sees his dead mother immediately running to the bathroom where he drowns his younger brother and then jumps out of the window before screaming, since you took her away, I'm taking us away. Jesus, talk about a gruesome situation. I mean, hell, if you ask me, this should have been the bad ending. Damn. But anyways, that's enough of the spoiler talk, so let's catch back up with the rest of the crew. Damn! Alright, so now that everyone's back together, I can say this was an awesome little story. I liked that it felt a little fresh and wasn't afraid to go to some really dark places. I mean, sure, it's not like tragedy is an uncommon plot point in video games or even back then, but having a game be so wrapped up in the general culture of prison life was actually really cool. I mean, sure, it's not what you would call wholly accurate, but I think anyone who's seen Central Booking will find something in this game that's at least a little familiar to them. At the end of the day, though, this is more of an interesting setting for a horror game than it is a plot point itself. All the bad decisions, the regrets, and the effect those things have on a person seems like fertile ground for a horror game for sure, and I think Surreal handled this really well. 
My only gripe being that all of this seriousness can be easily undone with the hardcore action focus of the game. Setting up an enemy as a threat is easy enough, but balancing the game so that they stay that way can be a hard tightrope to walk. Now maybe it's just me and my bias towards survival horror, but I feel like a gameplay style more akin to Resident Evil or Silent Hill would have been a better fit for the general tone of the story. What's here isn't exactly ruined by the heavy action focus and the whole dual wielding revolvers to take out a syringe monster thing, but I'd say a lot of the more serious elements in the story would have been a little easier to swallow if I wasn't an unstoppable killing machine with a demon transformation. The tale told here was well made and had a great hook, but the decision to make it a fun action game does cheapen it at least a little in my eyes. Regardless though, it is a more than worthy guide to get you through the game and I can confirm it gets a bit of its teeth back in the right scenarios. Trust me, playing a little suffering late at night with the headphones on and having its bloom lighting bounce around your dark room can really achieve the desired effect. Overall though, this is a great little story thanks to its horror and psychological thriller elements. It certainly walks on the darker side of things, even taking into account your average horror game which is still really cool to see. It's pretty easy to feel like you've seen it all in the horror space and like nothing can get to you, but then the suffering has you hallucinate your 11 year old son beaten bloody by prison guards and you realize there's a little of that surprise still left in you. The Suffering is, at its core, a third-person shooter, and in that realm it does about everything you might expect, plus a little more. The shooting here won't exactly wow you or anything, but it certainly gets the job done, and a focus on enemy-specific strategies is very nice to see. Each monster in Abbott has a particular way to take them down that'll have you either using less ammo or losing less health, and the devs did a great job of communicating that through nothing but moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. And what I mean is, there aren't any loading screen hints that'll tell you the firing squad baddies will drop significantly faster if you take out their heads or that slayers will catch fire in direct light, but you see these things happening organically and it makes you feel like you figured it out on your own. The console versions of the game can rely pretty heavily on auto-aim, but to be fair, I found that to be a good practice here. It's no secret to those of you who've been around for a bit that I just flat out suck at playing shooters with a controller, and even though the game can often dip into the realm of helping too much with the auto-aim, it achieves the desired effect in my opinion. Speaking of shooting, I'd say the in-game arsenal is pretty boilerplate. All of the obvious picks are here, and they work like they usually do in any other game, but besides the missable flamethrower, which I never use due to a lack of available ammo, it's a pretty bog-standard lineup. And as long as I'm being picky here, I'm not sure exactly why they'd have a bunch of quasi-modern-day prison guards carrying around drum-fed Thompson submachine guns. Trust me, these things were well out of commission around the time people started using phrases like word is bond. Word is bond, I'll fuck you up. Keeping on the subject of guns, let me go ahead and assure you right now, you will not be running into a lot of scenarios where you run out of bullets. It seems like every square inch of the game is littered with ammo, throwables, and healing items, and yeah, that can have a negative effect on the difficulty, but in my experience, it didn't go so far as to feel like they're babying you. I mean, yes, you are going to come across mountains of bullets, but your average enemy does take a lot of shots to put down, and the game is not shy about throwing waves of these guys at you pretty often, so I feel like it's a pretty well-maintained balancing act for the most part. When engaging in combat with said enemies, I found the third person view to be pretty good, but out of the box, the right stick sensitivity is a little too low, so if an enemy got behind me, it would feel like an eternity went by before I've turned around to face them, but this can be tweaked in the options menu. You're given a nice little left and right dodge roll to get out of hairy situations, but to be totally honest, the amount of recovery frames needed after the roll and the wealth of healing items you'll likely have on you will almost negate the need for this perk entirely. In most scenarios, a little circle strafing is all that's outright required of you and any attacks that get through that rock solid strategy are easy enough to eat without worry. Getting back to the subject of the perspective though, I'm sure you've noticed that the suffering gives you a first person view and while it's nowhere near as smooth as you might want for the console ports, I still found it helped me shoot a little better in some scenarios and if I'm being honest, just sort of made fights feel a little more dynamic. Kind of like if things got too bad, I had at least a few options that might help me even the odds. 
Mostly I used this in wide open areas and when the slayers would jump on the ceiling inside the prison, but aside from the general addition this adds to gameplay, I just find it to be pretty damn impressive for a game running on the PS2 and Xbox. Considering the fact that some devs have problems getting their games working from just one perspective, having both of these views supported and working as well as they do here is a pretty big testament to these guys knowing what they were doing. Plus, there's just something about seeing those chunky-ass PS2 polygons up close like that. It just does something for me. Progression in the suffering is sort of level-based, but sort of not. Sections of the game are broken up by loading screens, but when you've reached the next area, you'll find more often than not, you have the ability to turn right back around anytime you want and go back through the last area you explored. Although I'm not really sure why this is included. There's no real upside to backtracking past just picking up a few ammo deposits you didn't get on your first pass, but like I said earlier, you won't exactly be hurting for ammo enough to warrant taking a trip like that. Still though, it's kinda cool the options there, I guess. Most of your time with the suffering will be spent engaging in combat, but you'll also be doing a fair amount of exploring too. The sections you're locked into can be pretty big and are actually really fun to fully check out. There's always a little out of the way ammo pickup or something to make it worth your while, but there's a bit of a problem with some of that exploration. Like I said, areas in the game can be big and oftentimes it can be a chore figuring out just what the hell the game wants you to do in order to progress. Don't get me wrong, there's always an obvious answer and most of the time you're going to be kicking yourself for not seeing it earlier, but there are a few scenarios that can be really easy to get stuck in. Once you start getting a feel for the kinds of things the game expects from you though, a lot of this will subside, but you're going to have to keep an eye out for a bit. For example, it may be expecting you to turn a crank in a room opened by an explosion, but if you were across the map shooting at enemies when that explosion took place, it can be a little easy to pass it by. Or the game might want you to put out a fire to proceed, but it might be a little hard to tell since you've come across countless fires that you couldn't put out up to this point. It's game logic stuff like that that'll get in your way mostly, with a few exceptions that came from me not panning my camera up enough to notice there was a second level I could jump up to in a few situations. Now this certainly isn't something you're going to need to be worried about going in, but do expect to have to keep your eyes peeled for at least the first hour or so. Okay, now this isn't exactly a downside, but I was really confused by the devs making the flashlight run off of actual batteries that need to be collected. In a horror game, having your only source of light consume a limited resource is actually a pretty good idea, but the suffering gives you so many batteries that it kind of defeats the purpose of making it limited in the first place. Look, if you're going to be giving out batteries like candy anyways, there's really no need to make the flashlight a meter you have to manage. That's just one more brain cell the player would be able to dedicate towards combat. One thing that was a very welcome surprise for me was the suffering's length. Most people will probably be able to see the ending within 9 hours or so, and to me that seems like a perfect time investment. It's not so long that you end up getting really bored when the game stops being able to throw new stuff at you, but not so short that it's over before you really hit your stride. And really, the general frantic pace of the game makes that 8 or 9 hours go by a lot quicker than you might think. I was also really stoked to see that every version of this game allows you to save pretty much anywhere you want. Not only is this amazing to see on a console game from the early 2000s, but hell, it's not used enough today. And since there's a little more to talk about as far as ports are concerned this time around, we'll break with Avalanche Review's tradition and cover each version's gameplay before we compare the visuals. You have proven yourself. I still say inmates are scum, but you, maybe less so, see? <laughs> and starting out, we'll go with my first run-in with The Suffering, its PlayStation 2 release. This bad boy targets 30 frames per second and only allows for 480i out of the box. Although I am recording at 480p here, but we will talk about that when we cover the game's presentation, I promise. And I'm going to go ahead and level with you guys right off the bat. This is the worst performing option out of the three by a country mile. I mean, it shouldn't stop you from playing this version or anything. After all, I was able to complete the game back when it first launched with no real issue, and it was my first introduction to the series, but for this video, I thought I'd play the better performing versions of the game first, and it turns out that was a mistake, because it really made the flaw shine much brighter here. On PS2, the suffering hits major frame rate dips, and when you're working with a mere 30 FPS ceiling to start, with, there's not exactly a lot of room for that kind of stuff. After playing the Xbox port, the PS2 version seemed to handle noticeably more sluggishly, and that led to combat feeling much less satisfying. 
It felt like I couldn't really hit enemies quite as well, and depending on the scene, you can see the frame rate absolutely tank around the 10 FPS territory. When things were running slow, I often felt like by the time I could react to something, it had already hit me, and I struggled aiming at enemies' weak points. It was jarring to say the least. <sighs> Controlling the game itself outside of the insanely low average frame rate felt about on par with the other versions, but on the plus side, I feel like the PS2's controller layout was the only one that felt right in my hands. So if I'm being totally honest, it was a little sad coming back to the version of the game that served as my first experience and finding out it was pretty damn flawed, but this journey's not quite over yet, so let's head on over to Microsoft's side of town and see how they handled it. The Xbox port of The Suffering hit store shelves the same day as the PS2 version, and while it certainly makes up for some of Sony's shortcomings, it falls flat in enough areas that the gains almost zero out. This version of the game targets that same 30fps frame rate, but as a nice little bonus, natively supports 480p. I'm not sure if it supports 16x9 like a lot of Xbox titles do, but I didn't really check because widescreen aspect ratios at 480p just don't look very good 99% of the time. And yes, if you were wondering, the frame rate feels noticeably smoother, but this is not exactly a storybook ending. There are still huge drops that can be felt when things get chaotic on screen, and they still have a noticeable effect on how the game handles. It's certainly a substantially better experience than the last port, but to be fair, that was a pretty low bar to clear in the first place. I will say though, the default controller layout on Xbox feels like it was created by someone unfamiliar with the concept of comfort and muscle memory. And I would typically complain about the controller itself, since I seem to be part of a very small minority that finds the OG Xbox controller to be some of the most awkward and uncomfortably designed interfaces in the industry, but I decided to use a Brook wireless adapter and a PS4 controller to remedy that little problem. Luckily, I wasn't able to notice any perceivable lag with the adapter, and the Xbox's buttons map to the PS4 pad in a much more convenient way layout-wise. I'm loading this game off of an internal hard drive, so that may explain this, but I found the load times on Xbox to be crazy fast for a console of that era. And for comparison's sake, I also ran the PS2 port off a similar mechanical hard drive, but it was much slower. I did run into several issues with this port outside of how it played, but we'll have to save those for the presentation part of the video. Outside of that, I did experience one hard freeze, which was a little surprising, but I'm willing to bet this was something caused by my disc image or the way I'm loading it and not something you'd need to worry about with a retail copy of the game. If you have to choose between one or the other, I'd say the Xbox is the way to go from a purely gameplay-driven perspective, but like I said, there are some visual issues here that might make that recommendation a little less firm. Of course, we can't stop the comparisons there, because there would eventually be another choice for people looking to play a little suffering. You had a wife, right? Did you love her? How far would you go to make sure she stayed yours? Just a few months after the suffering's console debut, we'd end up getting our hands on a Windows port that's actually kind of cool. This version of the game can double the console's max frame rate at 60 FPS and with an easily obtainable patch can scale to your monitor's resolution, whatever that may be. And like you might expect, from the very start, that 60 frame per second gameplay felt worlds apart from the other two ports. Combat felt smooth and satisfying to a staggering degree, and that even played a part in this version feeling much easier than its console brethren. I've also got to assume that using a keyboard and mouse played into that equation as well. Oh, and since we're on that subject, this port does not have any support for modern USB controllers out of the box, and there are no mods I've found that implements it, but you can use a utility like XPatter to get that working if you want. Personally, I think the game plays great without a controller, but if that's not your thing, like I said, there are definitely workarounds for it. You've got to get me out of here! No! Audio in this port seems to be handled differently from the console originals, which normally wouldn't be mentioned here in the gameplay section, but it sort of does get in the way of actually playing the game sometimes. It seems to me like the music, dialogue, and sound effects are all processed at the same level, and one of those elements can often overpower the rest depending on the scene. I can only help you if you help me. Certain things a man's gotta do 
It's certainly not the worst audio I've ever heard before, but it can obscure AI partners when they're trying to tell you where you should go next, on top of really messing up some cutscenes. On the plus side, all of those audio levels can be tweaked individually in the options menu, and I definitely recommend you do that, because out of the box, the PC version can be very harsh to listen to. That aside though, I'd say this version should be the go-to port for most people wanting to experience the suffering today. You can mod in support for modern resolutions, and the jump from 30 to 60 frames per second with no worry of jitter or slowdown really can't be overstated. I will, however, admit I might prefer the console versions. If anything, just for the nostalgia you really can't get without the whirl of a disk drive operating and a controller in your hands. Of course, me being me, there are visually related reasons as well, but we'll cover those in just a little bit. Enough. Weapons to the ready. And now that we have taken all the ports into consideration, I can say this is a really damn impressive little horror game. I don't really have any complaints, minus how hard it can be sometimes to divine what needs to be done in order to proceed, but again, this is an issue that is almost always solved by retracing your steps and keeping a close eye on your surroundings. Realistically, it doesn't necessarily offer anything new or interesting, but it takes a pretty classic third-person shooter formula and executes it nearly flawlessly. I really enjoyed the large amount of exploration necessary, and that's both because these kinds of games can often be relatively linear, and this is an environment I actually wanted to see more of. If you'll remember at the start of the video, I said the developers were targeting an experience that had quote, the frenetic gameplay of Devil May Cry meets the horror setting of Resident Evil and the immersive game world of Half-Life. So I guess the question is, did they deliver on that initial goal? And yeah, I think they did. Well, minus the whole Devil May Cry part. I mean, obviously, your moveset and arsenal are nowhere near that level of depth, but the action is just as satisfying, just in a different way. So you definitely won't be performing any jump cancels or air juggles on Carnate Island, but you will be having fun, and that's good too. That being said, other than that one element falling a bit short of expectation, I'd say these guys achieved way more of that lofty goal than could be reasonably expected. The suffering is no more or less than a very solid package, which I guess isn't something to get all worked up about, but that's just one part of the equation. Having the third person shooting or exploration work really well is great, but on top of that is an interesting story wrapped in a uniquely intriguing setting all inside of a really well cultivated atmosphere. And in English, I think that roughly translates to, you should play this game. I want it. And now we are getting into the real interesting stuff. The Suffering being a PS2 era release already does a lot of stuff I really get into. See, I came up in a very interesting part of the home gaming revolution. Everyone at this point knew that they weren't going to get anywhere near photorealism with textures, geometry, or lighting, and definitely not on console. So instead, the goal sort of morphed into designing interesting little visual tricks that would ostensibly take the place of real-looking assets. And I sort of grew to really enjoy that method because unlike photorealism, the early 2000s approach to graphics allowed for a little more creativity and artistic interpretation. For example, these light shafts right here are clearly transparent 3D objects with a bloomed out light source attached to them and no one would ever call them realistic looking, but they are very nice to look at while serving the same purpose dynamic light shafts would have. I don't really have a properly explainable reason, but I just really enjoy this kind of hyper-stylized approach, and lucky for me, the suffering is chocked full of similarly awesome effects. The textures wrapped around character models all look a little flat and lacking in actual texture, which is definitely expected for a console release of the time, but the enemies and Torque himself fares much better in that department. And since we were talking about PS2 era lighting, The Suffering makes great use of moody darkness punctuated by a whole lot of bloom. 
which is interesting for two reasons. Number one, it looks pretty good, and number two, you didn't see a lot of bloom lighting on the PS2. Most of the time, it was relegated more to Xbox titles, most popularly Fable. And I think most of you who are around at the time will remember that when bloom lighting was used, it was often overused. And the good news is, I would say that's mostly not the case here. Although they do apply that effect to the mainliner enemies, and when you get a bunch of them in a room, it can be pretty damn overpowering. Mostly, though, you'll see it in places where you would actually expect light levels to be blown out, like Killjoy's projections, the fire, and the muzzle flash from your guns. I also noticed a little more trickery with this weird shadow map applied to wet surfaces to give the illusion that they're actually reflecting the environment around you. It's all of these cool little workarounds I find so damn interesting here. Like sure, it would have been nice to have actual dynamic shadow casting light sources or real time reflections in this game, but that just was not feasible at the time. So the team had to get creative, thinking up combinations of less complex effects that might give off the impression that something more resource intensive is going on here. I don't know, maybe it's something about seeing how creative people navigate their way around limitations, but regardless of why, I really love this stuff. And since we're on the subject of things that I love, it is awesome to see that each monster you come across in the game represents some form of execution that took place on the island. The Slayers obviously have their basis in jail yard shivs, the mainliners lethal injection, and most interestingly the Inferna, who represent three little girls who back in the 1600s accused over 10 people of witchcraft leading to them being burned at the stake. If I had to guess, I'd say Surreal were copying Silent Hill's homework pretty hard here, but if you're going to be inspired by something, you could do a lot worse than SH. It would have been nice if some of these deeper meanings wouldn't have been so on the nose, letting interested players dig deep and figure out who represents what, but that's not a huge complaint in the grand scheme of things. Keeping the upsides rolling right along, I really enjoyed how Torkoal started to show how much blood you're spilling in combat on his character model. It might look a little cheesy, but hey, what do you want, I'm a cheesy guy. I just sort of wish it didn't go away so abruptly. The way it disappears all at once can really take you out of the experience sometimes, and if that doesn't do it, seeing it happen close up in a cutscene definitely will. Having a first person mode toggleable with a button press is really damn cool, and I imagine it was not an easy task to implement. It may shine a bit of a harsher light on the corners that needed to be cut in the texture and geometry department in order to keep home consoles from bursting into flames, but I've always liked the smooth look PS2 3D had, so being able to see all those assets up close is more of an upside for me regardless of how dated they may look. And to be totally honest with you guys, I'm not really sure what's left to say here. The Suffering is a great looking video game that flat out does not get the respect it deserves for pushing tech that wouldn't become commonplace till the next generation of consoles would roll in. So I guess that's it. I'll see all of you next time. And until then, as usual, I'm Jared and this, no, I'm just fucking with you guys. We've got ports to cover and by God, that's exactly what we're going to do. Shit, there's something in here. It's in here! Help me! Starting off with a PS2 version, we've got a resolution of 480i and a frame rate target of 30fps. And with a scaler like the RetroTINK 5X, 480i can look incredibly sharp. So there's certainly nothing wrong with just going interlaced here, but I typically use a utility called GSM to force compatible PS2 games into 480p and the suffering just so happens to work with it. So I decided to record my footage in progressive scan. I checked the two out side by side and there's no real discernible difference from one to the other as far as a still scene goes, but with 480p we don't have to worry about the combing artifacts that come with interlaced video. Normally when making these videos I like to give people an accurate sense of how the game looks, so I use native video output, but I feel like this is a pretty good compromise here. Interestingly though, forcing 480p while totally perfect in every other sense causes this visual glitch that only occurs when looking at security monitors. That's kind of fun. But getting back on track, I think this might be my absolute favorite looking port out of the three. Of course the PC port looks much better from a technical perspective, but to be honest, I feel like these old PS2 games don't really benefit from the smoothing effects of high res PC ports. Like I said before, this game was most definitely optimized for consoles, so textures can be a bit flat and the overall look can be a little lacking in detail. 
Add to that the oversmooth look of pushing this game to 1440p on PC, and I think you've got something that technically looks good, but lacks the texture and depth you'd see on PS2. I don't know, that alias sharpness and the subtle warmth of analog video, you just really can't beat it. That being said though, this is not going to be a wholly positive story. This version, despite looking much better to my eye, suffers from a whole lot of very frustrating issues. Starting off with the least offensive, we have a very short draw distance in some locations, leading to backgrounds less than 10 feet away from you being obscured by darkness in a very unnatural way. Now this isn't going to pop up always, but as soon as I left the prison, I saw it way more than I'd like to. And to be fair, it's not a huge issue. I mean, it is a fast-paced shooter. I doubt very much you'll need to stare into the distance too much, and that is true, but our next issue deals with that whole fast-paced shooter thing. That being the fact that this game runs like absolute ass on the PS2. This thing will slow down to insane degrees, and it happens often enough that I'm confident it'll even bother those of you watching who aren't very sensitive to frame rate fluctuations. It can get very bad, and that would be one thing if this were just a nitpick over some comfort feature, but you will need to hit targets in this game, and most of them are going to be moving faster than you. Having this game, or I guess really any game, drop to 10 frames per second while you're trying to line up a shot on a bad guy can make that process infinitely more difficult. After playing all three versions and coming back to the PS2 to get a little extra footage, I found fights to be way more challenging by comparison. I flat out just did not feel like I was hitting what I was shooting at a significant portion of the time here. Now it is important to say I was still able to beat the game with no problem, so whatever negative effect the slowdown is having obviously isn't making it unplayable, but I'm pretty confident most people will agree 10 FPS in an action game is not ideal. So let's check out the next port on the list and see if it fares any better. Just fucking kill me! That being the Xbox release. This version of the game offers 480p out of the box and targets the same 30fps that the PS2 version does but does so with a little more success. Don't get me wrong, it's still going to chug when things get hectic on screen, but it doesn't seem to fall as far and as often as the PS2's frame rate does. I was able to find some spots where the Xbox actually fell behind the PS2, but from my subjective and not provable perspective, combat feels much smoother here. I'm not really going to be able to explain it, but on Xbox I was coming out of fights just feeling like I had done some cool shit most of the time. It was overall easier to hit moving targets, and I didn't have to heal as much as I did on the PS2. Which, if you ask me, is a good enough metric to prove one plays better than the other. So the Xbox is without a doubt the king of the console ports as far as performance is concerned, but once again, this is not a fully positive story. One of the bigger issues during the PS2 generation was a game being developed on Sony hardware first. The reason being the PlayStation 2 offered developers a lot of custom tech to work with. Sure, it was significantly more difficult to develop for, but despite the big divide in specs between the Xbox and it, there were just some things that worked better on PS2, and sometimes there were things that only worked on PS2. The suffering in another bout of following in SH2's footsteps is a great example of this in motion. For example, you can see here that both console ports use a pervertex system for the flashlight's glow on the environment, but on Xbox the effect looks terrible with the individual vertices being very defined and noticeable as you move. The same thing goes for the screen blur that happens when Torque is having a flashback or hallucination. See on PS2 how the blur affects the on-screen reticle in a very uniform way? Well, on Xbox, this effect is totally broken, looking more like four individual effects happening on top of each other and showing the, I don't know, seams for lack of a better word, where they intersect. There was also a very odd difference, not in resolution, but in screen size. Putting the two side by side, I noticed that the Xbox version was actually using the full 480p to display vertical graphics, where the PS2 version left unused space on the top and bottom of the picture. At first, I was going to declare that a win for the green team, but then I looked a bit closer and it turns out this isn't an increase in viewable screen real estate, but instead on Xbox, the image is actually being zoomed in and stretched slightly. See over on the PS2 side where Torque's foot is above where the crop occurs at the bottom? Well, on the Xbox, his foot is actually getting cut off by that crop. 
If we stack them vertically, we also see that the Xbox has a much wider image than the PS2, and maybe that sounds like an upside to you, but keep in mind, any stretching that's going on is going to affect sharpness and clarity at least a little, and when we look at the two side by side, it seems clear there is definitely some stretching going on here. After capturing all my footage and looking at it really close up, I did notice there was a pretty big difference in sharpness between the Xbox and PS2. So whatever they did to get this game running on Xbox, it certainly was not any kind of an improvement, because what I'm seeing here are all downsides when you compare the original to this one. I mean, it would be one thing if they just stretched the video, maybe after the fact, to fill the vertical real estate on a TV a little bit better, but it seems clear to me that internally they were zooming in on the frame and then taking that picture and stretching it vertically afterwards, and it looks pretty bad. Oh, and by the way, just in case any of you have noticed, there's something wrong with my component cable here. For whatever reason, it keeps showing purple ghosting on some colors, and that's not the game's fault or anything, I just wanted to point it out. I used a different cable and that remedied the problem, but I had already captured most of my footage already, and it didn't show any kind of a difference in sharpness or clarity. So the Xbox version is most certainly the winner as far as performance and playability goes, but it struggles to keep up with the PS2's sharp visuals and proprietary graphics effects. On a more interesting note, there was a significant difference in audio between the two. The Xbox seemed to offer much better sounding, higher bitrate voice samples and effects. Here, take a listen. A lot of the lights were destroyed in that earthquake. You'll need a flashlight to see a damn thing. A lot of the lights were destroyed in that earthquake. You'll need a flashlight to see a damn thing. The PS2 port sounded very tinny and the reverb effect was sort of artificial sounding to me, while on Xbox the voice sounded much smoother and the reverb more natural. Honestly, you guys have no idea how excited I was when I accidentally stumbled onto this while editing. As weird as it sounds, fun little discrepancies like this are what gets me out of bed every morning. So I guess in that spirit, let's check out the next and last port on the list. This was your life, T. How did you let it get away? The PC release of The Suffering dropped just a couple of months after the console originals and in its modern iteration, meaning modded, it can hit essentially whatever resolution you want it to. By the way, I'll be linking that mod down in the description so you can try it out yourself. It tops out at 60 frames per second and I never saw that fluctuate even a little so like I said before it is leaps and bounds better than the console ports as far as satisfying gameplay goes. I'm using a widescreen patch found over at the Suffering's PC Gaming Wiki page which lets me crank this bad boy out at 1440p with no issues. Well almost no issues. See, this is a true widescreen patch, which means instead of stretching the 4x3 visuals, we actually get more viewable graphics on screen, which looks amazing and really helps the game play better, but sometimes this has the downside of showing assets on screen that weren't necessarily meant to be seen. For example, the devs clearly never planned on their game being viewed in widescreen in this scene, so they had Torque stop walking when he gets off screen and has a cutscene, more detailed model of him spawn in, but since the viewable real estate has now been expanded, you can see his character model stop and how the new one just sort of teleports in. Oh, and the security monitors also got messed up, which is kind of funny, it happened in two different ports for this game and both times when I was trying to push it a little further than it actually wanted to go. I wasn't able to find many more examples than that, but I didn't play this version of the game all the way through. Still, I'd imagine this won't be a massive issue for most people. Hell, I didn't even notice it until I was editing this video. Aside from that though, this looks pretty damn good for an early 2000s PC port, and the fact that it runs on modern versions of Windows just cannot be understated. I would personally argue the older look of the game doesn't survive that smooth effect at higher resolutions, but even I can admit 60 frame per second gameplay and widescreen support is a little too good of a deal to give up on. Listen, my heart is still with the PS2's presentation, but I am most definitely cheating on it with the PC port's gameplay. There were a few rough spots though. I found one area where the ground was transparent, which might have added to the horror for me. Like I said, I didn't beat this version, so there might be more examples, but this wasn't pervasive enough to even really bother me. Overall, this is the clear best option to go for out of the three from nearly every angle. Like I said, I do prefer the look of the PS2 original, but I don't think I could come up with a rational reason for that if you forced me to. Then, of course, you have to take into account how most people don't have a PS2, let alone some kind of an expensive scaler that'll let them play that PS2 on a modern TV. So for ease of use, accessibility and functionality, this one definitely gets the recommendation. Fuck you! <laughs> Those are right! <laughs>
Of course, I could not leave you guys hanging without a side-by-side -side comparison. Obviously, the console ports aren't going to be able to compete with the PC in terms of sheer resolution and smoothness, but like I said, I still think the PS2 is where the suffering shines best. Although looks aside, the PC release is the recommended way for someone new to the game to give it a whirl nowadays. It's available for next to nothing over at Good Old Games at the time of writing, and along with the widescreen patch, this thing is a pretty complete package. And consider this a friendly reminder that the game can be found in the link in the description, so check that out if you're looking to play The Suffering and support the channel at the same time. The name is Clem, sir. I've been plotting my escape from Abbott for years, and I had hoped to carry out my exodus tomorrow. But these recent events have ruined everything. Well guys, The Suffering is an awesome little time machine if you ask me. While playing it, you can really feel the trends in game design at the time and the amount of experimentation that was often done at the AAA level back then. It's got a fun little horror atmosphere and gameplay that, while sort of overshadowing the aforementioned horror elements, makes for a really fun time. Truth be told, I hadn't touched this game since I first beat it all those years ago and as such it rarely came to mind. I still had fond memories with the game, I just never gave it a second thought, and after coming back to it after all these years, I found it to be way more fun and satisfying than I remembered. If you made it this far into the video, I'd hope the overall message is clear by now, but just in case it isn't, the suffering is really fun and it'll give you an interesting, horror-skewed look into a type of dark storyline you don't see too often outside of Silent Hill. Sure, a guy with memory loss having to come to grips with his past isn't the most unique story ever told, but using a prison as a setting and dealing with the scarring and brutal atrocities that took place there makes for one hell of an awesome approach to horror. This being a PS2 slash Xbox era release, it has the bad luck of getting lost in the shuffle. People obviously love old retro titles from the PS1, SNES, or Saturn, but the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox sort of get lost in this not quite retro, but not quite modern middle ground. That being the case, I wouldn't be surprised at all if a lot of you guys had never really seen it running for yourselves, and if that is true, I'd recommend you remedy that ASAP. Well guys, I think I've said all I needed to, and it's about time I get back to work. So here's hoping I see all of you again, but until then, as usual, I'm Jared. Word is bond, I'll fuck you up. And this is Avalanche Reviews. I think we can all agree that sometimes the worst thing that can happen to an interesting, flash-in-the-pan type of experience is for it to gain commercial success, which admittedly flies in the face of logic. But hear me out, I think getting more money and more people involved in a passion project can be its killing blow sometimes. It can drain uniqueness and fun out of the final product with the intention of making a game that can appeal to a wider audience. Risky, experimental decisions can have their rough edges sanded down, smoothing out what might have been a genuinely fun mechanic in the process. So the question today is, can a relatively small, quirky title like The Suffering survive that process and come out the other side with its one-of-a-kind charm intact? Well, I guess it's about time we found out. What's up guys, I'm Jared and this is Avalanche Reviews. Towards the tail end of the first Suffering's development, lead designer Richard Rouse III was already considering the possibility of a follow-up, but wanted to make sure that didn't impact any story beats in the, at the time, unfinished first game, which already bodes well for Ties That Bind. As anyone who's been gaming for any amount of time will tell you, a developer resisting the urge to sequel bait at the end of their game isn't an everyday occurrence, although we'll discuss later how that might have been a move with a lot of good intentions behind it, but may not have worked out in his favor. Much like their first offering, the goal going into The Suffering 2 was to marry the demonic, hell on earth type of apocalyptic happenings with incredibly dark events in real life, like the atrocities of American slavery, the Great Depression, and rampant drug abuse in the inner city, which are the kind of themes I genuinely enjoy seeing in the medium, even though it does make me question whether or not I'm a bad person. Hey man, what, what, are, you, what are you doing there? On the floor. 
And funny enough, speaking of which, one of the best parts about sequeling a game that allowed the player to achieve different endings depending on the moral choices they made during gameplay is that you now have to decide whether or not you're going to negate those outcomes and boil them down to a single ending or take each one into account and let those choices continue to decide the kind of person you get to play as in the next title. And well luckily Surreal went with the latter option there. On console, booting up a game of Ties That Bind will scan your memory card or hard drive for completed games at the first suffering and will offer that same moral path at the start. But the really cool thing is it also lets you choose a different one, and since the PC version didn't give me that option, I can confirm this seemingly simple three-way choice can have a really big impact on the story you get to enjoy. But on that note, I think we should probably dig into that story a little deeper before we go any further. And it would appear our dashing hero talk is right back where he started. Sad, isn't it? Psych. I bet you guys weren't expecting a sponsor here, huh? Well, truth be told, it's really not. Instead of telling you about some product you don't want, I figured why not let you guys know about a channel you could get some entertainment out of. So let's just think of this as, this video was brought to you by Jordan Allen, a YouTube channel with one of the most disturbing images I've ever seen as its profile pic. Now there's a reason you don't see me doing this very often, and I know just putting this out there will open me up to more requests for similar plugs, but this was way too unique of a situation to ignore. First off, and let's get this out up front, Jordan is a supporter of mine on Patreon. But that being said, I think most of you guys know you can trust my opinions don't get swayed by money. To date, I've turned down four sponsored spots from Raid Shadow Legends. Trust me, I don't change how I feel for any dollar amount, or at least no one's offered me enough yet. So that being said, I am being completely honest when I say I wholeheartedly recommend you guys check this man's content out. As of now, he's got a variety of stuff to watch, but I'd say the standout entries would be his reviews of the movies Prisoners and Good Time. After watching some of his stuff, he has proven that he knows how to write his script, and even more importantly, he knows how to express the aspects of media that are, more often than not, hard to parse through the filter of speech. Seriously, I can't recommend these videos enough. Now, earlier I mentioned odd circumstances, and that was a bit of an understatement. During a live stream, maybe a month back, me and Jordan were going back and forth, and it turns out that we lived in the same small town in Tennessee and ran with nearly the same crew. Hell, this guy knows one of my ex-girlfriends down there. And further expanding on that, we both lost members of our immediate family relatively recently. He has a series on his channel where he remembers and honors his late brother by playing through Kingdom Hearts 3, that being a series that they shared a connection with as kids. I think if you're like me and have both lost a close loved one and seen the first-hand effects addiction can have on a sibling, this might be a series you'd get some catharsis out of. On top of that, Jordan lives in Korea, and maybe with a little collective nudging, we can convince him to release some content about what that's like. I'm sure some of you guys watching know what it's like to try and grow a channel organically and how that process can often filter out talented creators because they don't cover trending topics or spend hours faking the perfect wide open mouth pick for their thumbnails. So let's take a step towards slightly correcting that issue, even if it's just for one creator. I'll have Jordan's channel linked in the description and in the pinned comments, so do me a favor and just swing by and see what you think. If it is the kind of content you'd like to see more of, throw him a sub and let him know exactly what it is you enjoy or don't enjoy about his work. If you're a larger channel, maybe give him some advice on making better videos or how he can grow a little more. Of course, if you're not into movie reviews or any of the other stuff I mentioned, that's fair enough, but maybe give a fresh face a try. Worst case scenario, you've spent less than 10 minutes watching a video you didn't like very much. Well, I want to give a big thanks to Jordan for sponsoring this video, but let's go ahead and get back to the regularly scheduled review. Over here! I cannot break the news if you are so distant. At the start of Ties That Bind, we're given a nice little scene clarifying a few things that most of us were probably wondering about since the end of the last game. This little flashback takes place just about a year before the events of The Suffering and sees Torque locked up for a violent crime, but not the violent crime that got him thrown into Abbott. As he talks to a buddy, we find out that prison is the least of his problems, as his wife just served him with divorce papers, and according to this bug-eyed weirdo, it's all the fault of a guy named Blackmore, a name that won't be familiar to fans of the first game, but that's because you know him by a different one. Or, actually, I guess that really depends on the ending you got. Trust me, it's all gonna come together eventually. 
Anyway, he's in the strangest case of speak of the devil and he shall appear. This Blackmore guy just so happens to be serving a bid at Eastern as well, and his crew isn't too happy about overhearing some shit talking in their direction. And this is going to be a very weird gripe to bring up, but the fact that these guys are in prison and their overall appearance lets me know that they are very clearly AB. And far be it for me to make assumptions about people, but if I had to guess, I would bet a pretty large sum of money on these guys and Blackmore let's say not getting along very well. Okay, so back to the real business at hand, there is a lot of exposition getting delivered here, mostly tuned towards the idea that Blackmore sees all of this as a game and he thinks he can control all of the pieces on the board. And I would probably have something more profound and maybe more analytically driven to say about the story here, but Blackmore just belted out one of the coolest lines I've ever heard with a voice that's quite literally in the process of taking the pants right off me. Bluster is the tool of the sucker player. And I guess that makes a lot of sense because I did some digging and it turns out that Blackmore here was voiced by the late great Michael Clark Duncan. Man, talk about a perfect fit for the role. Anyways, to sum things up, smooth voice McDreamboat over here says he runs the whole prison and that includes Torque and his friend. And when the two push back, he reveals that he not only knows about our boy's upcoming divorce, but confirms he may have had a hand in it as well. So to wrap up the whole interaction, he makes sure Torque knows that he can get at his children even from the inside and that sparks a bit of a one-sided fist fight. One punctuated by a guy who can turn into a super demon somehow getting bitch slapped into an era where his sideburns make sense. Blackmore, disappointed in their lack of enthusiasm to follow his orders, tells his goons to have a bit of a boot party with our two heroes, but luckily before the fatal beatdown has a chance to start, a prison riot breaks out and the two slip away in the chaos. And this is where things admittedly get a bit weird for me. Now there's going to be a few moments like this in the story so I won't spend too much time complaining here, but it does seem very odd that the supernatural elements that took place in Abbott seem to not be localized to Carnate according to this game's story. Torque seems to be having the same visions, and creatures resembling the Slayers are showing up, along with a new cast of baddies. I mean, sure, it makes for awesome imagery, but I feel like it would have been more impactful to have shown something scary in a different way. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine actually being caught up in a prison riot. Inmates who might already have a reason to kill you are now on the loose, and the people who normally keep those psychos in check are currently being spit-roasted. Call me crazy, but it seems like the supernatural angle just wasn't necessary here. Anyways, this sequence ends with Blackmore sending goons at you until Turk lets his rage transform him, and then we cut to the real opening, which kicks off directly after the events of the first game with Torque in the middle of escaping from Abbott State Penitentiary. And for you newcomers, that is a prison that has recently had its population reduced to one metalhead slash weed enthusiast and about a million demonic horrors from what appears to be the depths of hell. So after hearing that, you might imagine wherever Torque ends up, it's gotta be better than where he came from. Until you find out he's headed for Baltimore. I guess better luck next life, Torque. And just as the poor guy finally gets a chance to breathe a breath of relief after escaping from what might as well been the biblical apocalypse, his escape boat is stopped by a group of paramilitary types claiming that everyone coming from Carnate Island has to be debriefed. And since Turk is technically still a convicted felon, they give him the old Hannibal Lecter treatment. As these guys walk him to whoever's in charge of this operation, you keep getting the feeling that this is far from an official military outfit. They keep referring to him as the prime target, and it'd be nice to know a little more, but just as the conversation with the woman who runs this outfit gets juicy, the place comes under attack, and in the ensuing chaos, Tork gets loose, only to find the same horrors he experienced in Abbott, also taking place on the streets of Baltimore. What follows is what you might call the polar opposite of the story found in the original Suffering. Meaning this time around, we get a deeply personal tale that's looking to dive deep into Torque's past and expand on what little we knew about him. As he proceeds, visions of his deceased wife lead him to their old apartment where he struggles with the rough shit that got him locked up in the first place. What goes down here depends on the ending you got in the last game, but regardless, let's just say it's some stuff Torque would rather not relive. You weren't a good father, not in jail. From there, it's essentially a game of survival, the goal being to get out of Baltimore alive. But on his way, he comes across the bar his buddy from Eastern runs, and once he gets inside, we get a look at what got him locked up for his first stint. Apparently, our guy was just minding his own business having a drink when some goon barges in and insults his wife and then threatens his kids. 
So Tork goes a little overboard and beats the guy's brains in when conveniently the cops show up to arrest not only Tork but also his friend that was bartending at the time for reasons I really can't understand but far be it for me to question the Baltimore PD. Of course those of you who already predicted Blackmore was behind this don't get any extra points. Fast forward more than a bit and in search of Blackmore we're led right to Eastern where all of this started and hints start dropping that things aren't exactly what they seem. We come across Miles again, but for some reason he's pissed off at Torque, and a few things start coming together, but sadly I can't say much more than that without spoiling a big twist that sort of affects both suffering games. So you guys know the deal by now. To keep from ruining this story, skip past the chapter mark spoilers, head to the timestamp on screen, or click the link in the description. Don't worry, we'll catch back up with you in one sec, I promise. There aren't inmates and COs now. There are just humans and non-humans. Alright, so Miles was going off about how he's never seen Blackmore and that he's been digging into him forever, trying to figure out just how to get back at the guy who's responsible for both his and Torque's imprisonment. But just as he's about to reveal why he's so pissed off, the lights go out and when they come back on, he's just a bloody mess on the floor. And by this point, if you've got a room temperature IQ, you probably already suspected the game's about to pull some very specific shit, and yes, by the end of the game, we do indeed find out Blackmore and Torque are one and the same. It turns out when Torque would black out, it was essentially just Blackmore taking control, and apparently this is how the guy ran a massive drug ring. And by this point in the story, you're probably wondering why the hell Blackmore is so obsessed with getting rid of Torque's wife, and it seems to be implied that she kept him from losing it quite so much, and Blackmore's main goal was to take full control of Torque. Now right off the bat, there are a few major issues with this whole thing, but there are two big ones. First off, this game was released long enough after Fight Club that people were already tired of the popular Tyler Durden plot device. And second, it really stretches credulity to assume that Blackmore was able to run a crime syndicate that was so successful he could fund a small army in the form of the Foundation while not physically meeting any of the people he worked with. Now I know what you're thinking, maybe he just took over Torque's body and physically met with all these people that he has these complex criminal connections with, but that's not the case. The guys working in the foundation seem to have no idea who Blackmore is, or if they do, it seems really weird that they would shoot at the guy who pays their paychecks. Same thing goes with the people in the prison. They have no issues with beating Blackmore down, so obviously they don't know it's him. But let's say there's some sort of in-universe lore that explains those little inaccuracies. It still wouldn't make any sense. I mean, even if Blackmore had control over Torque for, I don't know, half of every day, that seems like a pretty tall order. But regardless of how he got all of that done, it still seems pretty counterintuitive for Blackmore to also fund an organization that is plotting to capture the physical body he needs for all those criminal dealings. Literally none of this adds up. The pawn's off the board. Now only the real players are left in the game. Ready for checkmate? If I'm being honest, I do sort of like the angle where Blackmore is plotting to take full control over Torque, if we look at it in a vacuum. This of course being a sequel though, we have the full context of everything that led up to this moment and it seems really complex that our main character not only harbors an inner rage monster that when let out allows him to perform incredibly violent acts, but also a cold calculated criminal business mogul who runs a massive narco operation. These guys already did a great job with the whole monster inside angle, but adding another one to the mix just retroactively makes the whole series feel a little more cheap. It seems like they were just grasping at straws, and instead of saying, what kind of an interesting story can we tell, they said, well, it worked in the first game, we'll just do it again but different in this one. Which is really disappointing, because if I'm being honest, Blackmore is an interesting character and an even more interesting concept. It just sucks that it was executed essentially in the same way the first game's story hook was. Well anyways, I've got a lot of other complaints to talk about and I'm almost positive they are spoiler free, so let's catch back up with the rest of the crew. And the righteous shall put down the devil. Okay, so those of you who skipped ahead missed out on a bit of a rant, but don't you worry, I've got some heat for you guys as well. Now, I'm going to warn you guys ahead of time, I may spoil some minor events in the game here, and I do mean minor, but I essentially just want to vent about how bad this story can be and how little sense it makes. Alright, so here it goes. First up on the list is how the devs cheapen the events of the first game. In the suffering, the cataclysmic happenings on Carnate were sold to us as being wholly localized. 
Kind of like all the terrible acts that the island had seen were so strong they opened a pathway straight to hell and I really liked that. But in Ties That Bind, those same exact events take place and they are given no story time. Now sure, things weren't exactly explained in the first game either, but we were given enough info to form our own conclusions. And now that we're two games deep, it seems really weird not to address the portal to Hades that keeps opening up wherever Torque goes. And at this point, you may say that the story is not so much about explaining that, but it's more about the individual acts of cruelty and quote-unquote suffering that takes place in the game's settings. And I guess I would agree with that in the first game, but now that it's happened a second time, I really want to know what the hell is giving all this malignant energy a physical form. But moving on, second up on the chopping block is the shifting of focus from the place where all of the demonic murders were happening to the guy who's trying to survive them. The first game's story worked, in my opinion, because it shied away from over-explaining Torque as a character. Instead, Carnate Island serves as the main character, or at least the main focus of the story. We spent most of our time finding out about the terrible shit that went down there, or the people who that shit happened to. From start to end, we never find out much more about Torque than the fact that he's in jail for possibly killing his family, he's got a real temper, and this is not his first time on the inside. That's raw, Torque! You opened up his gray matter all over my brand new floor? In Ties That Bind, the entire game is dedicated to fleshing out his backstory, and in doing so, I think a lot of his appeal as a character gets stripped away. Now, I will admit, at first, it was really cool seeing more of the events that led up to his incarceration and finding out there was someone behind all that. But I think the devs went overboard trying to over-explain every little aspect of this guy's life. You may call me crazy, but when I'm controlling an anger-fueled murderer who's currently dual-wielding sawed-off shotguns, the experience is not improved by knowing he used to take his girlfriend to an old gazebo in the park. Of course, you might disagree there, and that's totally fine, but even if your position is that it's a good idea to flesh out what was originally supposed to be a stand-in for the player, Ties That Bind doesn't even use his past to tell a complete story. They include elements like showing the orphanage he grew up in, but nothing of note happened there. It wasn't responsible for turning him into the man he is today, or really anything else. It was just a place he lived for a bit. Or at the very least, that's what the story has us believe. In that same vein, they introduced the most useless element ever in the form of the Foundation. This militaristic organization serves no narrative purpose and never once is important to the story's outcome. At first, you might think that isn't the case since its leader Jordan says that the monsters we've been fighting are her life's work, but literally nothing ever comes of that. I'm not sure if she meant that she created them or that she studies them, but either way, there is never any resolution to that bit of dialogue. And if it does happen to exist, maybe in the unlockable journal entries that I can't seem to get any more of despite having beaten the game twice with two different endings, I would still be just as mad. If they were all her work, meaning she created them, it would take away the historical significance to their design in the first game, and if she had indeed been studying them, it would mean these things have shown up in the world before, and that again makes the events of the first game feel so much less special. Really though, either way you interpret what she said, it actively devalues the heart and horror found in the first game, and it seems so unnecessary for a character and organization that, like I said, serves zero point in the game's story. And since we're talking about the first game, I would absolutely love to know why Killjoy is still following Torque around. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's cool to hear that delightfully old-timey voice again, but why is he here? And why does he know about Blackmore? Is Blackmore also a supernatural entity? And even more importantly, is Killjoy also inside of Torque's head? Of course, these were unanswered questions at the end of the first game, but since that game never elected to tell a personal story, you never expected to get any personal answers. It just seems really odd. Now that Ties That Bind is looking to tell the kind of story that does answer questions, it seems to be ignoring all the obvious ones and only picking arbitrary side details to provide closure on. It's like if I told you I got arrested today and then the next thing that came out of my mouth was, oh and by the way, I was wearing jeans. I guess that does sort of round things out in a very weird way, but there are a lot more interesting and pressing questions to be answered in that statement. And speaking of closure, remember how after achieving the good ending and the suffering, Torque more or less came to grips with his guilt and even the apparition of his wife forgave him? Well, you better forget it or get ready for her to double back on that and start guilt tripping him mere hours after she convinced him to get over her death. Don't believe me? Well, here's a scene that takes place when you start with the aforementioned good ending. His men call him the Colonel for 
they follow his orders. And you did nothing. You might as well have killed us yourself. Moving on, anyone who played the last game in the series will tell you one of the cooler elements were the three sort of supernatural kingpins in it. People that lived and died on Carnate with their gruesome acts essentially guaranteeing them a seat at the high table of whatever the hell was going on there. And in Ties That Bind, we get similarly well-characterized psychopaths as persistent antagonists. I want to know all about you and what to find. Shut up, you little whore! What the? I will cut you! There's a guy who used to track down escaped slaves using hungry dogs in his hunt and a serial killer whose obvious issues with women caused him to slaughter prostitutes. Now these two, in my eyes, are equally as interesting as the bad guys in the first game. They not only have the same terrible historic event angle going for them, but they have personalities you just love to hate. I sliced her top to bottom so's to see her inner self. <laughs> Remember, blood's the best lubricant. The only real problem with them is, at least in my playthrough, one of them may as well have just not been there. I mean, both are consistently yelling at you throughout the story, but when I got to the end of my playthrough, I only ever fought Copperfield the Slave Hunter. And after a little bit of wiki searching, I found out that you can fight the creeper if you pick the bad ending, but why characterize a whole ass person in your game only to have them make literally no impact on the story whatsoever? And even if you could fight both of them, they still serve no purpose. If you'll remember in the first game, the three antagonists were looking to have you join their ranks. They wanted you to be part of whatever the hell was happening on Carnate, but here in Ties That Bind, they're just here. That's it. They do have similarly laid out backstories and interactions as the guys in the first game, but they just lack the reason to be there. And continuing on that thread of logic, maybe I'm crazy, but it seems like this story might have been written by more than one person, and the two may not have been on the same page with where they wanted things to go. There are a lot more unresolved plot elements like the ones I've been talking about, and by the end of the game, I felt like nothing had truly happened. I mean, sure, there were events that took place on screen, and I did watch them unfold, but they just didn't go anywhere. It was like watching an episode of a show and then halfway through switching over to the ending of a different show. Sure, there was some kind of closure provided, but it wasn't for any of the stuff I witnessed. You know, at the start of this video, I mentioned how The Suffering's lead writer said he made sure the possibility of a sequel did not affect any of his decisions going into the story of the first game, and honestly, that shows. In a bad way. The first Suffering was a pretty open and shut case as far as I'm concerned, minus a single line of dialogue and the good ending, and it's clear this guy just didn't leave himself enough material to form another story after he was done. Honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, the only word I can really use to describe this story is dirty. I so dirty, Ugh. It bounces around in a lot of directions, but never really settles into one. It introduces all kinds of new plot threads and then proceeds to leave almost every single one of them unresolved. There are characters in the story who have no reason to be there and no bearing on anything depending on the ending you chose at the start, and I didn't find any of the side stories to be anywhere near as interesting as the ones introduced in the first game. Plus, the good ending, you know the one most people would likely strive for, is probably one of the worst video game endings I've ever seen. Without spoiling a single thing, after the last fight with the main bad guy, Torque approaches him and after a single line of dialogue where the defeated antagonist essentially says, well you beat me, Torque looks off into the distance and the game flashes to the credit screen. Man, I hate to say this, but the suffering ties that bind story is... well it's shit. There's some really cool elements, a few impactful scenes, and some absolutely killer voice acting, but as a whole, it's poorly written and takes away all of the uniqueness that the last game worked so hard to establish. Now, I could totally get you thinking that I just didn't like the kind of story this game told, but if that was the case, I would just say I didn't enjoy it. No, this story is bad because the person or persons who wrote it didn't seem to understand much about story writing in general. In fact, it should have been good. There's a lot of cool stuff going on here, but I just wish someone who knew what the hell they were doing was writing all of it. I'm being serious as a heart attack when I say that I'm fairly certain there are suffering fan fictions out there with more well-told and well-written plots. In fact, I sort of get the feeling that a lot of this game's story ended up on the cutting room floor, but during my research, I couldn't find anything that points in that direction. If you know something I don't, please let me know because I would love to figure out what the hell's going on here. Well guys, I'll be honest with you, I am sitting here racking my brain trying to figure out some kind of thoughtful or insightful way to say this, but flat out, 
but I'm just disappointed. Jesus Christ, no! What are you fucking doing? Nowhere is safe. Well, moving on to a hopefully less depressing subject, let's talk about TTB's gameplay. I mean, it should be a hard concept to mess up. Just take the gameplay as it existed in the first game and transplant it into a new one, possibly fixing issues as you go. Right? Alright, so maybe I gave things away a little bit there, but let's talk this one through. So, on the surface, it's pretty easy to assume the gameplay experience here isn't too far removed from what could be found in The Suffering. I mean, just looking at this clip here, we can see a pretty similar setup. Third and first person shooting with an emphasis on fast movement and some light platforming to sweeten the deal. But it's the small nuances where all the differences live in ties that bind. For example, yes, you will be engaging in a lot of combat, shooting demonic abominations and turning into some roided outrage monster when things get hairy, just like in the first game, but there is a massive difference in the tools you use when engaging in that combat. And at first, this kind of seems like a positive, because Ties That Bind admittedly has a much more diverse weapon lineup than its predecessor. The revolver's been replaced with a dope-ass 1911. On top of the Thompson, there's three other auto-fire options, including an M60, two shotguns, a rocket launcher, grenade launcher, and Colt Python, and really, you'd have to be crazy to criticize the variety to be found here, so I won't. I will, however, say that it is very disappointing to see the suffering adopting the early 2000s trend of limiting the player to two weapons at a time. Now, realistically, you probably didn't use too many weapons back-to-back -back in the first game. If you're anything like me, past the mid-game, you were probably just switching back and forth between the Thompson and shotgun, so what's the effective difference here? Well, if you'll remember an entire video ago, the first game was almost too happy to supply you with ammo for these weapons, which was good because you were dumping pounds of brass into Abbott's monstrosities. Well, the problem in TTB is they wanted to keep the whole fighting hordes of enemies thing, but also decided they were no longer going to provide you with enough ammo necessary to do that. So instead of carrying an arsenal you can switch between, you're limited to a measly two weapons at a time, and instead of resupplying your ammo pools, the game has weapons just sitting around each area. So effectively, you'll use up the small amount of ammo you have on hand and in desperation be forced to pick up a different gun. Now I know so far we haven't exactly landed on any real complaints, but you gotta stick with me because this is sort of a compounding issue. For example, I know the whole running out of ammo and then frantically switching to whatever weapons laying around thing sounds like a good idea on paper, but in action, or at least in action in this game, it just does not work very well. In essence, the developers wanted you to constantly be looking for a new gun to pick up, which in my mind really stands in the way of the fast-paced action they're throwing your way, but worse than that, I often found myself in this really awkward middle ground, where I wasn't quite empty with one of my guns, but there was a new one being offered at the end of an area, and I had to play this game of, well, I only have 12 shells left for my pump-action shotgun, but there's a Thompson with full ammo right here, so do I roll the dice and assume there's going to be a shotgun refill ahead, or will I be left in a combat situation? with no ammo because I assumed I'd be able to pick up some more shells. Now in their defense, the devs did litter each area with weapons to pick up if you're in a pinch, but that leads to the next problem in this three-issue layer cake. A good number of your options as far as weapons go are flat out next to useless. One of the newer guns in the game, the Scorpion, can be dual wielded, which is awesome, but it's going to take a whole ass magazine to down even the starting slayers. The upgrade from there is an M3A1, and it's not only just as bad, but seems to go through ammo even faster than the Scorpion, so it defies logic by taking even more ammo to down the same exact enemies. Another example are the sawed-off shotguns, but they're in a similar boat for different reasons. They're double-barreled, so you're only going to be able to dish out a maximum of four shells before reloading if you're dual-wielding, and by the middle of the game, that is just not going to cut it. By my estimation, there's maybe two viable options, and that is the pump-action shotgun coupled with the Thompson. The only problem being, the two shotguns don't share an ammo pool, so you can't pick up shells from the sawed-offs, and the Thompson only gets introduced towards the last quarter of the game. The Colt Python, like you would imagine, basically rips through everything in a single shot, but you rarely come across ammo for these, and I only found an opportunity to dual wield them maybe two areas before the last boss fight. So what this all boils down to is, you're not going to have ammo for any of the good weapons, so you're going to have to use the shitty ones. And the problem with the shitty ones is, they get you killed because they don't do anything. Because they're shitty. 
Listen, I know that was a really roundabout, drawn out way of saying that, but the point here is that these three things come together to form a really unpleasant experience. I was always nearly out of ammo when searching for the next pickup, and normally that'd be an upside in something like survival horror, which I love. But in those types of games, you're not facing down a theoretically unlimited army of bad guys. And since we brought it up, we may as well use the most popular example of that style of gameplay, Resident Evil, which is balanced around a very specific amount of enemies and a fixed amount of ammo. The two mechanics blending together to create the fear of running out of ammo, while the game keeps you just stocked up enough so that you don't. In ties that bind, you are almost constantly shooting at enemies, and because of that, almost constantly running out of ammo. And that's not a fun gameplay mechanic, but instead the result of a developer introducing another game's systems without understanding how it would interact with what's already here. I mean, I know they got criticized for giving the player too much ammo in the first Suffering game, but the answer isn't to keep the same level of difficulty in enemies but take the ammo away, because that doesn't make any damn sense. <laughs> Keeping in that same spirit, I felt like my shots often went through my enemy's hitbox, especially with the shotgun, a problem that only got worse as the game threw more and more hard-hitting monsters at me. This problem seemed to exist in both third and first person perspectives and seemed to be present across all ports, so this is one scenario where I can safely say it wasn't just me, or if it was, it was very consistently just me. Now, those four issues are terrible on their own without a doubt, and they definitely bring down what otherwise could have been a much more fun experience, but there's one more bow that ties, get it, ties the bind, all of these things together. A cherry on top of a sundae made from whatever gross thing an exaggerating YouTuber would use to show how much they don't like something. And that is a seemingly small change. See, in the original Suffering, you collected bottles of Zombium, healing items that could be used at the press of a button, and this played pretty heavily into the way you engaged with the game's combat. While in Ties That Bind, these bottles of Zombium have been changed to an instantaneous health gain on pickup. So there's no stacking health restores here, and this one small change, in my opinion, has the biggest effect on TTB's playability. In the original, having a few healing items on hand meant you could get close to death several times in a fight and still come out the other side, which was a really good thing because that game threw you into massive skirmishes with lots of targets pretty damn often. Ties That Bind, looking to improve on the original's gameplay, also has you coming up against large groups of bad guys who are now way stronger it seems, and you don't have the safety net of Zombium to help you out, making combat here significantly more difficult. I mean, it's almost night and day between the two. Now, it's important to mention that people did complain about the first game being a little too easy, and maybe there's some truth to that, because I might have died like three times total in my playthrough of the last one. But here in the sequel, I saw that many deaths and maybe the first big combat section on the streets of Baltimore. At first, I thought this might be due to some kind of an increase in enemy damage output, which for sure Malefactors hit way harder this time around, but as I played more, I noticed a bigger change than that. And to talk about that, we're going to have to broach yet another complaint. Ties That Bind is a much more linear game than the last. No longer are you going to be led through large areas and trying to figure out where to go next. Instead, you walk down very linear, straight line paths until it winds out into a small, self-contained combat arena. And in that arena, you're going to run into one of two possible scenarios. You either defeat all of the enemies until one spawns in that will destroy a barrier that was blocking your way, or deal with a never-ending assault until you solve some kind of environmental puzzle. Now, these two seemingly unrelated issues come into play when you realize your main supply of health restores lie on those narrow paths leading to the more open areas. So when a fight breaks out, it's fairly often you're going to have to clear it with minimal healing items. And that wouldn't have been so bad if the devs hadn't have also implemented the same exact combat mechanics from the first game. Essentially, they transplanted a gameplay style that necessitated near constant use of health restoring items, but didn't give the player access to those items when they most need them. I am honestly not lying when I say that every other combat scenario in this game had me dying at the very least once. And yes, I do know that's going to get me several of the inevitable get good comments, so my response to that is first off, one of the largest middle fingers ever seen by humankind, and second off, maybe yeah, I'm not the best. 
But I do play what seems to be much more difficult third person shooters like Max Payne 2 and I don't have as much of a hard time with them, so maybe my ability to click a mouse and move it simultaneously isn't all of the blame here. I also think there's a point that needs to be made here about difficult games not automatically being bad games. After all, I do play a lot of Stalker, and depending on the mod I'm using, taking a consecutive 10 steps outside of Rookie Village and Cordon is the equivalent of a high score in that game. Under the stairs over there? Oh, did I get caught in it? I did. Fuck. My main issue with TTB is that my deaths didn't have me getting better at dodging attacks or prioritizing targets. Instead, I would enter a combat arena, die after a battle of attrition, and restart the fight now knowing a little more of what the game wanted me to accomplish there. So each fight became a game of trial and error. Sure, sometimes I might luck into finding the door I was looking for or crank I had to turn before dying, but most of the time I would die until I stumbled upon the way out and then restart the fight with the knowledge needed to get through and run straight to the required MacGuffin before enemies even had a chance to spawn in. And sure, it does feel nice sequence breaking any video game, but TTP made progress feel like a slog through the mud. I'd hit a progression benchmark, die, make it back to that point, plus a few inches, and then die again, wash, rinse, repeat, for about 7 or 8 hours. And again, keep in mind I was also dealing with hitboxes that would often not register point-blank shotgun blasts to the chest, a max of two switchable weapons, ramping up of enemy damage, oh and did I mention they removed the dodge roll? Yeah, you know that one move I didn't use very much because I could tank so much damage thanks to the ability to heal at the press of a button in the first game? One that specifically would have been really useful to have in a game that doesn't let you tank so much damage and necessitates dodging more. Yeah, maybe I'm a little pissed about that. Especially since it's not actually fully removed, but instead only activates while you're crouching. Sort of like the devs were just thumbing their nose at you. And I know what you're thinking, just hit crouch, jump in a direction all at once, and yes, you can technically do that, but the crouch animation has to half finish before the roll initiates, effectively making the move useless unless you're already crouching when damage is coming your way, which is never. Oh, and this one was a little harder to fit in with the general theme here, but NPC pathfinding was absolutely fucked on every version of the game I played, which is a real issue when part of engaging with the moral choice system is having these NPCs follow you and make it to a certain point alive, which only added to the amount of restarts I had to endure. I'd get one of these idiots past a combat section unharmed and then have them follow me across a rooftop, only to hit a level transition and see that they never followed me into the next area, and... Of course I couldn't go back to get them. Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. Well, folks, it is absolutely official. My cat Rufus does not like the pathfinding in this game. Okay, so I know I essentially front-loaded all of my complaints here, but that's mostly because A, I have so many, and B, the rest of the game feels so much like the first suffering that I thought I'd just be repeating myself, and let's face it, these videos are long enough as it is. Now I'm really not trying to give the impression that this game was all downsides, it really wasn't. The parts that emulated the suffering experience that I'm used to really worked well. I mean side strafing, getting a critical hit with a shotgun, and blowing the top portion of a bad guy's torso off is a feeling that may rival getting laid sometimes. Plus, I'm really not able to quantify exactly why this is, but the game plays much better in its included first-person mode than its predecessor, which may explain why most of the footage you've likely seen so far has been in that perspective. On top of that, and mind you I'm about to sound crazy here, but there is at least one aspect of this game that's much better than the first, and I think that's its setting. The streets of Baltimore make for a way cooler arena to fight demons in, and overall I've always preferred this kind of quasi-contemporary urban environment when playing fantasy games. I also kind of like that they added special elite enemies that could only be killed with Torque's demon transformation. That felt like a natural evolution of that mechanic and forced me to use it a lot more than I did in the first game. Really, I enjoyed a lot of aspects of TTB on their own. Like, if you took still screenshots of my experience, you'd probably find me having a good time, but when all of those elements combine and start playing out in motion, things can turn really bad. And maybe that wouldn't have been quite so terrible if I didn't have the original to compare it to, but the suffering ties that bind makes the odd choice of mirroring most of its predecessor's mechanics while changing everything else around them enough that those mechanics just don't work very well anymore. It's kind of like performing, I don't know, an engine swap from a Ferrari to a Honda Civic. 
Maybe you could jerry-rig some way to make that happen, but I doubt very much you'd be getting anything close to the performance the original Ferrari was capable of in the first place. The worst part here being, none of these changes were even necessary. These were all features that worked perfectly well in the first game. Of course, I get the idea of improving on things for the sequel, but if the new version of the mechanic isn't as good as the old one, maybe it's not an improvement. All of these issues culminate together into this weird feeling that the developers were trying to fit their unique and interesting IP into a more traditional AAA mold, and the consequences were a lot of those well-made elements not making it through to the other side. For all intents and purposes, in my opinion, the first game, with its more experimental nature and rough edges, comes across feeling like a more competently put together end product than the game that received more funding and got more attention during development. I think what happened here is the same thing that plagued so many dev houses during the switch to 3D around the PlayStation and N64 era. Solid developers who understood their jobs very well were thrust into unfamiliar territory and otherwise quality-laden IPs were coming out with massive issues all because the people making them, despite being well known for their great output, were so far outside their element. Maybe in trying to spruce up the suffering for a wider gaming audience, the dev team working on it had to adopt new or unfamiliar mechanics leading to a noticeably worse end result. Guys, I'm not going to lie to you here, so far it has been a very depressing process writing this script. When working on my recent video covering the suffering, I remembered how much I enjoyed it and that got me really excited to see where the series could go from there, but now that I know the answer to that question, I'm sort of left wishing I never wondered it. Of course, it's possible I have some kind of bias I'm not aware of or my taste just may not align with yours, but in my honest opinion, those of you who haven't played Ties That Bind yet would do well to keep it that way. I mean, it's not like it's broken or anything, it's just not fun enough to be worth the effort it takes to beat it, in my opinion. Normally, as far as I'm concerned, when a single element in a game isn't up to snuff, I can typically count on another to get me through it, but the borderline unfinished nature of the story and buggy, frustrating gameplay... I don't know, I just don't think there's much here to satisfy someone who's looking for more of the suffering. No joke, guys, I get absolutely no joy out of being this negative here. Going through the comment section in my previous video had me coming across a bunch of you that actually prefer this title to the original, and the last thing I want to do is actively shit on a game that so many people really enjoy. But honestly, the suffering ties that bind really didn't give me much of a choice. You know that's how these bitches work. They slide up in close and try to suck your life away. Graphically speaking, The Suffering was a pretty cool package. It wasn't the most well-rounded game visually, but it did a lot to approximate interesting effects that would have been far too straining on the hardware to actually implement. On top of that, character models sat in this sort of half-cartoon, half-realistic place on the spectrum, which meshed really well with the smoother, less detailed environments. Overall, I really enjoyed it, although I was not the biggest fan of the hit that performance took in a lot of the busier scenes. Well, moving on to the sequel, Ties That Bind is pretty much what you would expect. A fairly similar look, but with a few extra polygons added in here or there. And in a very welcome change for this video, I would say it's a mostly positive affair. Of course, me being impossible to please, I do have my complaints, but as a whole, I really like the way TTB looks. It seems to be going for a incrementally more true-to-life look, which is always nice to see, especially in a game that takes place in a real-world location. Character models definitely have more definition to them, and animations seem a little less, I don't know, weightless. I'm not sure how to describe it, but in the first game it seemed clear the animations were all handmade instead of motion captured, and the result was sort of like gravity had less of an effect on Torque and the people around him. Here things seem a little more grounded, and I would assume some of the cutscenes had mocap work done. Now, there's no doubt that the inside of a prison is already a scary enough environment on its own, and filling that place with Cenobites that have shivs for arms is just the juiciest combination of terrifying elements. But like I said before, contemporary, realistic settings have always been my bread and butter. And in that sense, I think TTB actually takes a W here. I really enjoyed running through the streets of Baltimore while it's experiencing its own localized apocalypse. The dingy alleyways, tall apartment complexes, and cracked brickwork, it all felt like the right place to set a game like this. Plus, it made for some really fun progression gameplay-wise. Like, sure, you could probably sit down and predict all the environments that you'd visit in this game and get it mostly right, but if you think a rundown trap house isn't an awesome location to fight needle-wielding demons, then maybe there's something wrong with you. 
From moment to moment, the game does a good job of leading you through interesting settings that are pretty varied for what they had to work with. City streets filled with survivors and, well, non-survivors, an apartment complex ravaged equally by the current apocalypse and decades of disuse, sewers teeming with soldiers working for the agency, and holes ripped through the concrete leading to the depths of hell. Or I guess if this story is to be believed, the depths of Torque's injured psyche, maybe. I don't know. Do you remember how that played out? Exactly how that played out? Out of the many, many elements in this game that disappointed me, I'd say the move to the streets of Baltimore was a clear and warranted upgrade from the original. And continuing that thread, the monsters and themes that created them have almost all been brought over from the first suffering, plus a few more to boot. The slayers, mainliners, burrowers, and marksmen have all made a return, and the expected jump and visual fidelity is really nice to see. Also, the new additions all seem to follow similar design philosophies to their forefathers. They all fit some form of terrible event in Baltimore's past and are essentially physical representations of some form of... suffering. Oh, that's why they call it that. Well, anyways, it should be clear that my experience with TTB's presentation is miles above the other aspects of the game, but that certainly doesn't mean it was a wholly positive affair. So let's get into some stuff I either didn't like or thought was done better in the last game. And Jordan, she soon to spill what she knows. Now come on! My aim was always true. And off the top of my head, I would say the first thing that really struck me was the field of view. Ties that binds camera sticks way closer to Torx's back than I was used to in part one, and for a while at least, I couldn't help but feel a little claustrophobic with how little I could see of my surroundings. To be fair though, you're not going to run into this issue on PC because it technically supports widescreen since the fans essentially hacked it into the game. And on that note, I wasn't able to find any glitches this time around caused by the unofficial 16x9 patch, which is interesting because it's the same exact patch I used on the first game. But getting back on the original issue, it's not just the camera being zoomed in that makes me feel so claustrophobic. Overall, environments are more closed in than the wide open areas found in part one, and a lot more of TTB takes place in interior environments. Now, I've got to assume that they zoomed the camera in like that and made the environments more closed off and less wide open because they had to account for the added polygons the game was pushing, but either way, it had a negative effect on the gameplay in my opinion. Also, I would like to officially be the most petty person alive and say that I really don't like that they had Torque speak in this game. I know it's just three words throughout the course of an entire video game, but I sort of like that Torque is mute across the first suffering. Looks like trouble. The developers said they wanted Torque to come across as brutal and animalistic, and I think that worked because the guy never really humanized himself by talking to the people around him. I know it's dumb, but it did bother me. Not enough to really complain about, but at the very least enough to mention. And to be completely honest, I don't think I can really come up with any more, so why don't we change gears for a bit and take a look at how each port of the game fared. <laughs> so I guess we'll start with one of my favorite consoles of all time, the PS2, and the package here is a... complicated one. This release outputs a native 480i, although you can force progressive scan through an app called GSM, and that's exactly what I did here. Oh, and I waited to give you the most awesome news last. Out of everything I could talk about here, the most exciting upgrade from the original to Ties That Bind is a frame rate target of 60 FPS. Of course, we are talking about mid 2000s console hardware here, so don't expect an experience locked around that ceiling, but hey, an upgrade's an upgrade. And starting off, I was really interested to see that this time around, the team at Surreal seemed to have cut back on the PS2 specific effects and better optimized for multi console releases. If you watched my last video, you'll know I praised the effects and tricks used to achieve the suffering's impressive look, and a lot of that came from tapping into the PlayStation 2's unique approach to hardware. Of course, that would naturally mean a lot of those effects would not end up making the transition to the Xbox flawlessly, and at the time that was just a side effect of the major console players using such wildly differing architecture. Now, I'm always going to appreciate when a dev shows more love for the PS2, but realistically speaking, it would make a lot more sense to build the next game so that it could be represented evenly no matter which hunk of plastic and silicon you have sitting next to your TV. And that indeed seems to be what they did here. I didn't notice any obvious signs of proprietary graphical techniques not showing up right on one console versus another, which is good, but it also kind of makes things a little less interesting in my opinion. That being said, it's not like there were zero differences. I would assume this time around Surreal developed on Xbox hardware primarily, and the porting was done on the PS2 side. 
I say that because looking at the two back to back, we can see the textures on Xbox are far more detailed and high resolution, meaning the game's assets were most likely made at a higher resolution for the Xbox and then bulk compressed to perform better on the less powerful, at least on paper, hardware inside Sony's black box. Now I could be wrong on that front, but that seems to be the most efficient way to do things in my mind. Okay, so lower res assets. You would assume that would mean that it might have an okay frame rate, but that is most certainly not the case. Putting the Xbox and PS2 version side by side, you might see a few short instances where Sony will take the lead, but on average, most of the time actually, the PS2 is going to perform worse. And going by this graph, it may not seem like it's by much. I mean, in some scenarios, the two are neck and neck, but I think the real culprit are those big spikes in frame time. This lack of smooth frame delivery leads to the PS2 port feeling much more choppy and less smooth than the one on Xbox. Now, because it's so hard to get a direct apples to apples comparison of two similar gameplay scenarios where I move my character and camera in the same exact way across both consoles, this can be a little hard to prove. But trust me when I say in a moment to moment gameplay scenario, you're definitely going to feel the dips in frame rate much harder on this console compared to its competition making the PS2 once again the worst way to play a suffering game, which really sucks because just like its predecessor, this port is the one I most enjoyed visually. The Xbox version certainly doesn't look bad, but it seems to lack the overall sharpness and clarity seen here. Of course, there are going to be noticeable benefits over on the Microsoft side of things, but if we're just going by still comparisons, I just really like the look of the PS2's offering much more. Also, the experience isn't consistently bad, which I think makes it even worse. Running around and exploring Baltimore can lead to a smoothish experience at times, but once enemies start coming at you in waves, the game's already harsh difficulty mixed with some questionable hitboxes and inconsistent frame delivery makes for a pretty rough time. Of course, I'm not going to say this is an unplayable version of the game. It's perfectly serviceable if you ask me, but despite my preference for its visuals, I'd say if you can play it elsewhere, you're probably better off doing just that. Alright, so moving on to the Xbox port of Ties That Bind, I found a few interesting little quirks and some big differences that only someone as mentally ill as me would ever notice, let alone care enough about to verbalize. First off, returning from the original Sufferings Xbox port, TTB's version on the big green sees the game populating every pixel in a 480p window while the PS2 leaves the top and bottom, I don't know, maybe 10 or so pixels blank. And once again, this does not mean that there is more to see in the Xbox port. For reasons I still don't understand, Surreal Games just zoom the image in on the Xbox to fill the entire vertical resolution of your TV. And like you might expect, that leads to some of the top and bottom of the picture getting cut off compared to the PS2, which can be seen here with the white chess pieces at the bottom of the screen not even being visible on the Xbox. And further into the realm of things that don't matter too much but are kind of interesting, this port is a bit darker than the other two versions. Of course, that always could be chalked up to the condition of the capacitors inside of my Xbox or a million other factors, so take that for what it is. I also noticed that the dialogue is much quieter in this port. In a few cutscenes, the sound effects were drowning out characters' voices, so I ended up having to lower the music and sound effects in the sound menu. Now, getting to the more important stuff, like I said earlier, this port performs much better on average than the PS2 release, and you can really feel that in the game's combat. But on the even brighter side, you can really tell a difference in how detailed 2D textures are, and I think the draw distance might be a bit further as well. And now that there are less proprietary graphical tricks being used, the Xbox is able to look exactly like the PS2 version when things like screen blur or bloom lighting is used. Overall, I'd say this is the version to grab if you absolutely have to play this game on console, and according to eBay, it seems to be the least expensive of the two as well, so that's pretty awesome. Sounded like another case of the white man interfering with our lives. Okay, and here we are at the third and final port of Ties That Bind, and as you would expect from a PC port that was handled by people who at the very least could tell their asses from a hole in the ground, it is the best way to play the game today. Thanks to the same widescreen and bug fix patch used on the first game's PC port, you can play TTB at essentially any resolution you like, and this is a proper widescreen implementation, which means the game's graphics aren't just getting stretched horizontally. So no worries about fat character models or ruined 2D assets. And you've really got to marvel at people who spend their free time making changes to old games like this. They even made sure not to stretch 2D images like the intro videos and collectible files, which since we're on that subject, I have a funny story about. 
So there's a section early on in the game where you can't proceed until you've read a note. The only issue being, getting to that screen requires you to hit one of the keys on the numpad, and if you're like me and use a 10 keyless keyboard, that's gonna be an issue. So I'm sure you're thinking, well why the hell didn't you just map it to another key? Well I did, but it literally did nothing. For whatever reason, I can use custom key mappings during gameplay or whenever else I want, but not in this specific menu. And at this point, someone who's, I don't know, normal would probably just grab an old keyboard and play through the game to get past this point with it. And that'd be fine if I hadn't just sold almost every single thing I owned to move to Tokyo. So I had to get a little creative here. So it turns out my keyboard allows me to customize the onboard firmware and add custom key combinations. It just requires a little messing with Windows command line and putting the thing into a service mode, for lack of a better word. And boom, I was finally able to proceed. Now sure, I didn't necessarily have to tell you all of that, but if I had to live through this to make this video, I'll be damned if you don't have to as well to watch it. Okay, so moving on to things that actually matter, I did find this weird glitch that only appears in the fire effect, and even then it's not all the time. I'm not sure if this is present in vanilla or if it's something the widescreen patch caused, but it's not a big enough deal for that to matter anyways. I wasn't able to test this, but I assume this port, like its predecessor, does not allow for modern USB controllers, but once again, a program like XPatter is going to fix that real fast. You won't necessarily need it though, because like any other third-person shooter, TTB plays great with the keyboard and mouse. Obviously, using a higher resolution is going to reveal things that the developers may have been able to get away with on console a little easier, like the distance at which lower quality textures and less detailed 3D models get swapped up being a lot easier to see in motion here. Something that is much easier to deal with when you consider the fact that this port would probably run at a locked 60 FPS on a damn Raspberry Pi. And when I say this drastically changes the gameplay, I really mean it. In my experience, sections that were tough as hell to pass on console were significantly easier to clear on PC and that is always nice. Now the game still deals out its share of unfair bullshit, but I mean come on, you shouldn't expect miracles from something as simple as a well-made port. For example, it doesn't matter how smooth the game runs, it cannot make up for this damn enemy being able to knock you to the ground and shoot you repeatedly while you go through your painfully lengthy getting up animation. Really though, even from the perspective of someone as odd as me when it comes to preferring the look of old PS2 era games on real hardware, you just can't get any better than this. The gameplay here on the PC port is the best you're going to get, and I'd be lying if I told you it didn't mitigate a lot of my complaints in that department. So if you're looking to play Ties That Bind and you're wondering about the best way to go about doing that, go with your first instinct and grab the PC version. In case you're afflicted with whatever makes me so damn weird though, here's each of the ports side by side so you can decide for yourself. As you can plainly see, there is a pretty big divide on one end of the spectrum, but for whatever reason, I still prefer the look of the PS2 version. Now to be fair, there's still a bit of blur when it's in motion, I assume stemming from the internal deinterlacing going on, so if I could get the PS2's picture with the Xbox's native 480p and maybe the PC's perfect performance, I'd be happy. But enough living in dreamland, for the average person the PC port is going to be the best, most convenient option, so let's leave that one as my recommendation. But you retro collectors read between the lines and get the one that speaks to you most. Cook it. Pull it out. Shoot it up. Yeah, that's right. Again and again. Keep it going. Well, there we have it. A pretty sad ending to what started as such an interesting story. The first entry in the Suffering's short series really grabbed our attention, and for good reason. It was a new IP that combined the best parts of horror and action games, creating a really exciting new entry in the AAA games industry. And what's about to come out of my mouth is pure speculation, but I assume it was a desire to better fit to that industry that ended up killing it off. The suffering was odd, quirky, rough around the edges, and most of all really fun, and I think a lot of the reason for that was because it didn't bend over backwards to please every single possible member of its audience, but instead was unapologetically itself. I imagine the success they saw from the first Suffering probably inspired the game's publisher Midway to get further involved with the sequel, and when a publisher invests more money into a project, that often comes with pressure to perform in order to make some of that investment back. And maybe this is one of the reasons, if not a contributing factor, to why Midway no longer exists. Regardless of the reasons though, the result is a game that does not come close to its predecessor in terms of entertaining, functional, and satisfying gameplay while its story meets a similar fate. I don't know how else to put it, but there is a lot of this game's story that felt either rushed or poorly thought out or maybe both. 
Not only was I not a fan of them further fleshing out parts of Torque's past that I feel like didn't need an explanation, but there are plot revelations here that make no sense or are never fully explained. And no, not in an ooh so spooky how vague this game is with its story details kind of way. TTB goes out of its way to over explain all kinds of stuff, but there are plenty of elements that just feel like the devs forgot to finish them. I truly would not be surprised if there was originally supposed to be one more chapter of the game to cap everything off because they were still introducing new plot elements in the second to last area and they go absolutely nowhere. On top of that, a lot of the changes made to the gameplay seem to have been done with no understanding how they would mesh with the foundational elements transferred over from the first game. All around, it just feels like a low effort affair, which really sucks because I know that was not the case. From everything I can tell, this series was a passion project for the lead dev, and I would have loved if that passion would have led to another top shelf banger. But hey, that's how it goes in this industry. Sometimes you eat AAA games, sometimes AAA games eat you. A saying that might hit a little too close to home, as Ties That Bind would be the last game Surreal would work on, or at least the last one it would complete under the title Surreal. And well, that's a little too depressing to think about for me, so instead I'll get back to work on the next project. But in the meantime, thanks so much for making it to the end of this less than glowing review. I hope you guys had fun, and I'll see you next time, but until then, as usual, I'm Jared. Motherfucker still stand. Don't know how. He'll be out of blood soon. And this is Avalanche Reviews. Well, ladies and gents, thanks so much for hanging out. If you get into retro, horror-adjacent games, well, I've got quite a few videos you might enjoy, and I'll also include a video from the YouTuber I mentioned earlier. No joke, Jordan is a super nice guy who really puts his heart into his content, so maybe check him out and see if it's the kind of stuff you'd like to see more of. And I assume you guys know the rest. There's a Patreon link here if you want to do that, but if that's not your speed, a like and subscribe is always helpful. Well, here's hoping you guys had a great day, and the next time I see you, there better be a damn smile on your face. Peace out, dorks. I'll catch you later.